everybody, how are you doing? Merry Christmas and welcome to Wi-Fi Sheep right here on YouTube with me, Tom. I hope you're ready for a month of festive fun right here on the channel. And we're going to start with a mysterious package that has been sent to me over two months ago and I've only now just got round to looking at it. Here it is, it's still in its sealed packing material. Now, I know what it is. And I've kind of ruined the surprise of this if you've read the description to this video, because you now know what this is. Uh, this was sent to me by Simon Pryat, all the way from Birmingham, which is sort of central England. And it's the first time anyone has actually sent me a retro machine uh, to have a look at and keep. So huge, huge thank you to Simon. Now, there was a few... Um, issues with this machine that I was aware of so we'll look at that in more detail when we actually open the package but it's been, it's been sitting here in the office for over two months now and I've only now just got around to looking at it but first it's that festive time of year once more and the fantastic PCB GoGo year end sale is now on all PCB GoGo customers new or returning can take advantage of a $50 off coupon when ordering your high quality, professionally manufactured custom PCBs. And in addition, FR4 and aluminium PCBs are now 10% off with an amazing 30% off flex and rigid flex PCBs. So don't miss out on the PCB GoGo year end sale. Sign up for your free account today at PCBGoGo.com. See the video description for full details and direct links to these amazing offers. Okay, here we are then. Here's the package and it's a big package. It barely fits in frames. So as I mentioned, this has been donated to me, sent to me by Simon Pratt. Um, very, very uh, generous offer and uh, we're going to open it carefully. So this hasn't been opened. I've had it sitting around for about two months because it's just been so busy. So let's carefully unwrap. By the way, quickly, before I open, just mention, is you on a sheep on it? That's a nice little touch. I like that. There we are. Anyway, sorry. Okay. So we're nearly ready. I said I'm opening this very carefully and there's a reason for that. And that's the reason I didn't want to just dig a knife straight into it. Let's just turn this around. So there we go. Sinclair. Polystyrene. This would have had a cardboard sleeve on it originally. And some elastic bands. This is... Hang on. This is 1981. 30... 32 years. So this is 30... Two year old polystyrene. Which is not a bad shape actually. Sometimes this stuff goes a bit sticky. Okay, let's open up. Ah yes, now you said I mentioned about being sticky. This is what I mean about stuff going sticky inside. Okay, so we've got a it's a video. A RF UHF video connector. We do have an original power brick. And you've seen this a lot where it's actually the polystyrene is reacting chemically with the um, plastic of the flex. And that's why you get this sort of almost chemical mounting happening. So that's what I was slightly cautious about. But there's an original power supply which we'll come back to in a minute. And then in here, let's, let's put these polys out of the way and have a look at this. Oh my goodness me! There we are. ZX81, bit of a, a gouge there, but oh well. Sinclair ZX81, which appears to have only one screw in and still got its feet on, just. Ports on the side, membrane keyboard. 
but yeah, what well, only one screw, so it's loose. Um, let's see, let's just grab a screwdriver. So yeah, there's one screw. Right. So there's your two part moldy plastic and here is your main PCB. And we have a I believe a heat sink of some description and there's two more screws holding this on interestingly if you actually look at this PCB it's rather different to let's say PCB you get made now so here's my tiny basic computer board and although obviously I've put a few um, uh, bodge wires on this particular board you can see this is when the computer and this is machine made, computer designed, and see how the tracks are all straight. Whereas if you look at this board, see how the traces are very organic. And that's because this board was actually hand drawn when it was etched. And that's why you don't see PCBs like this anymore. I will need to find something I say to put these screws. Okay, and there is the top of a ZX81 PCB. It's a single board computer, and you'll notice that the uh, the ribbon, which I was told about, has completely disintegrated. So this is the ribbon membrane that would go through to the uh, flat membrane keyboard, and it has completely disintegrated, which is not uncommon for ZX Spectrum and other Sinclair products of this sort of era. So there is the PCB of an actual ZX81 from 1981, I believe, 81, 82. That chip there, which is the Sinclair Research, that's the ROM, and it appears to be a couple of, uh, shorter than the actual socket it's meant to go in now. Is that correct or not? Hmm. Uh, this NEC part here is the ZX, sorry, or the Z80, Z80 uh, Zilog microprocessor. NEC is a Japanese part, and there's another Japanese ROM here. Um, I say ROM, not quite sure what that's for. And then we have the ULA. Now, the ULA is something that could go bad. This is a custom chip, very common with 8-bit machines, but the ULA chip, which is part digital, part analog, complete custom chip so you can't get replacements uh well not straight replacements like that and they just have a tendency to go bad we've then got three mono audio jack type things there uh, 1.4 inch uh audio jacks but they're not all audio because the power actually uses one of these um, and that might be a problem because what you could do is you could actually put your power into your tape, for example, which, uh, yeah, you don't really want to be doing. And then obviously you've got your RF uh, modulator. This thing only had RF, although I believe uh, com if you can ground it, you can probably pull composite straight off here and bypass the um, RF modulator altogether. Overall, the board looks in good condition. I just I'm not sure about this ROM chip. But it does say Sinclair Research, 1980 RON, so, but the chip socket's strange. And obviously you've got the voltage regulator, and that's attached to this piece of metal which acts as a heat sink. So it's generating different voltages. Um, actually, you can see there what uh, the... Let me show you that close up. That's the end of the uh, rather brittle membrane connector, which is just snapped off. So... We're absolutely going to need a new membrane keyboard. Not many electrolytics on here, just two from the looks of it, which look fine. And the others are ceramic, the orange things are ceramic disc capacitors, which very rarely, if ever, go bad. So, my thinking is as long as that ROM works, I and mean, nothing else is fried, the ULA and the ROM are fine, I imagine the Z80 
we'll be fine. Um, we might get somewhere. So I think what we'll do now is we'll turn our attention and have a look at the original power supply. So here is the rather stylish Sinclair um, power brick for this. And very, very dirty mains plug on one end. We'll come back to that in a minute. And this jumbled mess, you get, well, it's like an audio jack. And that was the problem. They used, for cheapness, they used the same audio connector uh, for power. And... Yeah, that in itself could be a problem. But what we'll do is I'm tempted to check this plug. So we'll untangle that in a minute. So you can tell the age of this. So this is a made in England. So it is a, a British plug. But I've covered this before, vintage electronics. It wouldn't meet any kind of modern standard. Uh, so basically you've got earth on the top and then you've got your positive, negative, live, neutral um, on the bottom here. And on modern plugs, if I just see if I've got a modern plug I can grab. Here's actually a modern plug I retrofitted to the NES power supply. So on a modern plug, you've got these plastic uh, sleeves. And that stops you from, when you're pulling the plug out, the plug still being engaged in the mains and you kind of touching two pins as you're pulling the plug out. Because um, it's 240, up to 240 volts on the UK power system. So with these old plugs, there's nothing guarding it. So that plug isn't legal. Um, I'm very tempted to actually, let's take the plate off and just have a look inside just to check everything's okay. I've got a big enough screwdriver to do this actually. So yeah, you'd normally use a much bigger screwdriver than this, but let's just take this out. This plug is absolutely filthy. So inside we're just checking that it is still fused. British plugs have a fuse inside. And that you see you've got the wires for uh, live, which is blue, ne neutral, uh, or basically positive, which is blue, neutral, which is brown, I think. Is that the correct way around? So basically you can tell it isn't the old red and black system. Um, basically that looks fine, as far as I can tell. And the fuse, it's in, so it's just very, very, very dirty. So I probably will need to change this plug. But for now, we'll we'll go, we'll go with what we've got, just to see how well that works. Always important to make sure you do put the screws back into plugs to make sure they are correctly aligned. Okay, that's fine. So we'll just uh, untangle this jumble of cables. Yeah, so this wire is not in good health. <laughs> it's, uh, this polystyrene has attacked the plastic, so that's why you get this sort of terribly matted, fused uh, effect. And we've got this standard plug on the end. So what I think I'm going to do is... I'm going to try plugging this into the mains, and I'll try running it just briefly without it being plugged in. You shouldn't really do that if you don't want to run... Uh, power supplies about a load on but I need to just check that this hasn't gone high or isn't putting too much voltage through so if we just have a look at the label it should be outputting 9 volts so it's 9 volt out so what we'll do and again we'll just try and untangle this the best we can is we'll actually put a crocodile clip onto each side of the connector so we don't want to short the connector so this black bridge here is the break between the two sides and I've got here my trusty multimeter and what we'll do is we'll clip these up to the other side Okay, and we'll turn on, and we've got it in the correct mode. So it's picking up a bit of residual something. Now this could blow all the lights up, this could blow up, or it could work. So let's put this into the mains and let's see what happens. 
Okay, 14. Hmm, 14 points. That does seem a little bit high. I'll be honest with you. Now I'll turn the power off and you'll see how it, slowly it drains out. It's not on load. It could be that high because it's not on load, but that seems that seems high. Hmm. Um, okay, well I was expecting that to run a little bit high because it wasn't what we call on load, but still that was that was high. So I don't know, do I trust that power transformer? Of course it would actually protect it. This voltage regulator would take a high current and it would break it up into whatever was needed. Um, I'm sort of tempted to go for broke, but we're going to need to sort out what we're going to do about the television picture. So this is an RF modulator and effectively what it is, it's a little TV um, transmitter box effectively. It takes a video signal in, so it should actually be composite video. Um, you see the two cables here, I don't know if you can see that. There's, I can put a scooter at the point to you. So you've got this feed here and this one here. And I for life can't remember which way around these go. Um, I think that's the ground and that is the video. Um, so it is possible to intercept the composite video signal being generated before it goes through the RF modulator. What the RF modulator does is it converts that to a, in this case, a UHF analog television signal. Uh, when this was released, a lot of people would not have had composite connections in televisions. A lot of British televisions literally had the aerial hookup and that was it. So they created these RF boxes and you still got these right into the 90s on consoles um, in one form or another and then you've got this uh, connector so it's got a sort of an RCA jack here but it's not composite and then you've got a aerial that's a standard British aerial connection for analog television now my experience in these RF modulators is they tend to be shot, completely shot. And on modern televisions, those that still have analog tuners, and a lot of my TV sets, even flat, the digital flat screens here do have analog tuners. Um, I'm not convinced that it's going to work that well. We almost could do with some sort of CRT to try powering up with. So, of course, being Wi-Fi sheep, I've got these little uh, black and white CRT monitors. You've seen them on the channel before. These mostly are used for composite, but they do have working UHF analog television tuners in them, which is exactly what we need. So these were sold all over the world. These ones for Europe, especially here in the UK, they're UHF only, 625 line PAL or 576i, if you want to be in digital. The black and white only and they're running at 25 frames a second at 50 hertz which is what we need to hopefully get a picture out of our zx81 board on the back of these a series of uh, plugs so normally you'd be using the composite uh, but we actually want to try and use the analog tuner so it has this little audio jack for an antenna or an aerial so we can't use the standard british connection so what I generally try to use is RCA composite cables that actually have a headphone jack type thing at the end and that will plug in and it then means that the other end will connect into well, one of these cables will actually be the live signal and that will plug straight into the RF modulator and then we can try and tune. Now it's always a bit of a guess as to which one it is. I normally think it's the white. It's never normally the video signal. But we'll see. This might not work. Um, so let's get the television powered up. There we go. That is coming up. You're going to get strobing. Uh, that's because the refresh rate of the camera is going to be different to the CRT. But that's now running. And we've got the static of analog. There's no analog left running in the UK. It hasn't been for many, many years now. So we shouldn't be receiving anything. But it should be possible to... Which is the tuning one for... Uh, hang on, I need to be on UHF. 
So that should be UHF. Dash, there we go. So you can see there's it tuning for the various frequencies. There is nothing on UHF. Okay, so we know that's working. So let's try plugging in. I've got the power supply for the uh, 81 here and I had to check which of these sockets is because this power supply can fit any of these three sockets and nine volts is here on the end. It's this one here, which we'll put in. So moment of truth. And this is the moment where many of you could be screaming at me not to plug this in because it was running so high, but let's see what happens. Oh, you ready? Okay. The picture here has changed slightly. So I'm just gonna tune around, see if I can find something. There is something there, because you can see this checkerboard pattern appearing. That one's not for uh I'm just gonna scan around and see what I can find. There's no real fine tuning on this, and I haven't done analog tuning in years. There is something there, so if I just pull the power. Yeah. Put the power back on and you can see there's this strobe but that is rolling. There's a slight checkered pattern rolling. So can we get it to sink in or not? Again, this um, modulator could be completely out of whack. So you can see that I've got a frame lock of sorts. Not sure what that's meant to be on screen though, but let's just power off again. And you see my power back on, so it's definitely the computer outputting something, but I just can't seem to get it. Okay, I think I'm going to have a little play with this just to see if we can get something to lock and anything tangible on the screen. Uh, yeah, I'll be right back. Okay, hopefully you can see that okay. So as a last ditch attempt, I'm just going to try going for the RF modulator again. I hooked it up to my desk TV that sits here. This is a much more modern TV. It does have an analog tuner, so what we'll do, it's not been tuned for analog in so long. Um, let's see now. So you can see how it's scanning through the UHF band. Uh, let's just see what it, well, it's trying to find digital at the moment, but it won't find anything because the only aerial plugged in is into this uh, ZX81 board. I very much doubt the tiny bit of cable I've just put between this board and the TV is going to be good enough to pick up any over uh, uh digital TV st oh it has it's found it reckons it's found 22 digital TV channels but nothing on analog I didn't want to do this because sometimes these digital decoders or even the analog tuners in these mod TVs are just not sensitive enough uh, to pick up signals like this so Oh no, I did. Oh no, I did see something. I did see something. Okay, so as expected, it didn't. I guess we're right. We're not going to get a copyright strike for that. That's found digital. There's no aerial plugged into this television, and it's found virtually usable. That's ridiculous. Right, where did we say it was? We said it was back down here. There is something on the screen, I can see it. Oh, there we go. Oh, there it is. 590. And I know it doesn't look like much, but you can see there's a little K flickering down here. It's not a stable signal, but it never is. Okay, I know it doesn't look like much, and there's colour um, block all over it, but yeah. So the machine is working. Um, the ROM isn't dead. 
the voltages seem okay so I do wonder if I can get that hooked up and working on the little monitor one thing I will just say quickly is that this uh, plate which is a heatsink for the power regulator my goodness is that hot that's really hot to the touch okay so the machine is alive which is quite something I wonder if we can just get a picture up on the other monitor or not I think the uh, tuner on um, that other set was probably a little bit shot if I'm honest um, because I've got that working pretty much perfectly this strobing is just the artifact from the camera not syncing with the CRT but that's actually a really crystal clear picture so it's working on this little um, portable uh, but not on not on that one. Oh well there we go it doesn't matter that's why I have a few of these little portable tellies because they are quite useful some days for testing with so there we go the machine is kind of alive it's going to need a little bit of work it's so cool to have a zx81 and one of the first zx machines or should i say z80 machines that i actually have here on the channel huge huge thank you once again to simon prior for the really generous donation here to the channel if you have a machine that you think I might be interested in, do drop me a line on Twitter. It's at Wi-Fi Sheep. That's at Wi-Fi Sheep on Twitter. Alternatively, you can email me. You can find the email for this channel in the contact details by clicking on the channel homepage here on YouTube. If you haven't done it already, please do consider liking and subscribing to us here on Wi-Fi Sheep. And I hope to see you real soon for some more festive fun. Until next time, look after yourself and bye for now. Thank you